By the end of 1964, beginning of 65, somewhere in that range, we had actually the first real synthesizer, analog synthesizer. Moog, he'd made modules, but he had not yet made a synthesizer. The whole idea of making a total environment where you create music with just electronics hadn't occurred to him at that point. So he wanted to do just what we did, but someone talked him into doing a black and white keyboard. <laughs> and that's what Wendy Carlos, or Walter Carlos, did Switched On Bach with. That was the following year. Walter, Wendy Carlos put out Switched On Bach. And that was like, for some reason, became this huge hit record. And everybody I knew, their parents had that record. I associated like the sound of electronics with the sound of the future. And when I started working on Silver Apples of the Moon, I had decided the first side was going to be pitch-based, squishy things that were going, you know, that flying around. And then the second part would be solid rhythmic stuff. No one in the world heard a machine making a solid beat. My God, this is unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't get enough of it. I was sitting there, I would just sit there grooving with this and moving, you know, like a ballet through this stuff. I didn't want to stop. It was just unbelievable. So Silver Apples, I would say, was like the true godfather of electronic music. And that, for me, was the introduction. Then, in the mid-70s, I spent a lot of time listening to AM radio and having I Feel Love come on the radio. You realize you've, you've never heard anything like this before. Only in Manhattan, and still at Studio 54, people crowd the doors, hoping to get in. The rewards for the lucky ones are a frenetic night of dancing in a setting like something out of Star Wars. I'm ecstatic. It's everything I ever thought it would be and more. When roller disco was popular, I was in all the roller skating rinks, and that's how I learned about DJing and programming music from going roller skating and seeing what DJs do. This guy, Dave Mancuso, in New York, wanted to throw parties at his place. So he christened it a club. It wasn't really a club, it was his loft, and charged people a nominal amount to come in. It had to be members to attend. And this is really where disco began. And these parties were places for people who were otherwise not a part of the rest of the scene in New York. They were black, they were Latino, they were Hispanic, they were gay, they were misfits in the rest of society. But at the loft, they were the kings and queens of the scene. The beginning of disco was definitely rooted more in a subculture and it got adopted by the mainstream and changed. And then when the mainstream discovered its subcultural roots, it, it rejected it. Disco was at the time very commercial music as far as I was experiencing it. But also since I wasn't like going to David Mancuso's parties in 75, you know, I didn't see it as revolutionary music. Now I see it as revolutionary music. But at the time I saw it as commercial reactionary music. The thing that carried disco from these places to radios across America and the world were hits. And no one had more hits in disco than Donna Summer. Giorgio Moroder and Donna Summer are really the most important producer and the most important artist of the disco era. And he got into the recording studio with Donna Summer, four on the floor, a thud, 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 and says, OK, I'm going to build music around this. And the first record that he records with this, a record called Love to Love You Baby. And this is the beginning, really, of Giorgio Moroder's major career as a producer and Donna Summer as, as someone who will become disco's most popular artist. The first record, I believe, that was like synthesized based, all electronics, something that no one had ever heard of before. Synthesizer disco, it never feels old. But as soon as the gay crowd came in in early 1970, the dynamic of the dance floor changed. All of a sudden there was this incredible energy, very much related to the gay liberation movement. Disco Sucks was not about the music. Disco Sucks was a reaction against the liberation of black, Hispanic, and gay people and women who had finally found a space for themselves in mainstream culture. And the straight white men who ran radio stations across the country were threatened. The Disco Sucks movement was as much about race and homophobia and the other as, you know, anything was. In the late 70s, 
1979, a guy named Steve Dahl, who was a radio DJ in Chicago, decided it would be really clever to create this disco demolition. In the middle of the game, he had encouraged people to bring him vinyl, and he was going to explode it on the field in some kind of performance act that really hadn't been seen since the Nazis burned a bunch of books in the 1930s. It is really sad to watch the footage of that day at Comiskey Park with the records burning because you feel, you feel the undercurrent of what it really was which was just so hateful. It was able to be, you know, turned off like a faucet and that you just can't turn anything off today. You can't, you can't deny anything from bubbling up today if the kids and the fans want to be a part of it. But it didn't die. It just went underground and it existed as it, as it did for many years before. It evolved. So dance music never stopped informing what was in popular culture. 